Purgatory Explained, Chapter 46, Advantages, Gratitude of the Souls. In order to understand the gratitude of the souls, it is necessary that we should have a most clear conception of the benefit they receive from their liberators, that we should know what it is to enter heaven. Who will make known to us, says the Abbe Louvet, the joys of that blessed hour. Represent to yourself the happiness of an exile who at length returns to his fatherland. During the reign of terror, a poor priest of La Vende was condemned to be drowned. Having escaped by miracle, he was obliged to emigrate in order to save his life. When peace was restored to the church and to France, he hastened to return to his beloved parish. It was a festival day in the village. All the parishioners went to meet their pastor and father. The bells in the old tower rang joyously, and the church was decorated as upon days of great solemnity. The old man advanced smiling in the midst of his children. But when the doors of the holy place opened before him, when he beheld again the altar that had so long rejoiced the days of his youth, his heart, too weak to bear such transports of joy, broke within his bosom. With a trembling voice he intoned the Te Deum. But it was the nunc dimittis of his priestly life he fell dying at the foot of the altar. The exile had not the strength to support the joys of his return. If such are the joys of the return of an exile to his terrestrial fatherland, who will make known to us the transports we shall experience upon entering heaven, the true home of our souls? And how can we wonder at the gratitude of the blessed whom we have caused to enter there. Father James Mumford of the Society of Jesus, who was born in England in 1605 and who struggled during 40 years in the cause of the church in that country, given up to heresy, composed a remarkable work on purgatory, which he had printed at Cologne by William Freyson a well-known Catholic publisher. This book obtained a large circulation and effected a great good among souls, the publisher Freyson being one of those who derived the greatest advantage from it. This is what he wrote to Father Mumford in 1649. I write, Father, to inform you of the miraculous and twofold cure of my son and my wife. During the holidays, whilst my office was closed, I set to work reading the book, Mercy Exercised Toward the Souls in Purgatory, which you had sent me to print. I was still engaged in reading the work when I was informed that my young son, four years of age, showed symptoms of a serious illness. The malady made rapid progress. The physician lost hope and preparations for his burial were already thought of. It occurred to me that I might perhaps save him by making a vow in favor of the souls of purgatory. I went to church early in the morning and fervently besought God to have pity on me, promising by a vow to distribute a hundred copies of your book among the ecclesiastics and religious free of charge, in order to remind them of the zeal with which they should interest themselves in behalf of the church suffering, and of the practices that are best suited to fulfill this duty. I acknowledged that I was full of hope. Upon my return home, I found the child better. He already asked for nourishment, although for several days he had been incapable of swallowing even a single drop of liquid. 
the following day, his cure was complete. He arose, went out for a walk, and ate with as good an appetite as if he had, had never been sick. Penetrated with gratitude, my most urgent desire was to fulfill my promise. I went to the College of the Society of Jesus and besought the fathers to accept my hundred copies, to keep what they wanted for themselves, and to distribute the remainder among the other communities and ecclesiastics of their acquaintance, that the suffering souls, my benefactors, might be comforted by new suffrages. Three weeks later, another and not less serious accident happened to me. My wife, upon entering the house, was suddenly seized with a violent trembling in all her limbs, which caused her to fall insensible to the ground. She soon lost her appetite and the power of speech. All manner of remedies were employed, but in vain. The malady only increased, and all hope seemed lost. Her confessor, seeing her reduced to this condition, sought words to console me, exhorting me to be resigned to the will of God. As for myself, after the protection I had experienced from the good souls in purgatory, I could not think of despairing. I returned to the same church, prostrated myself before the Blessed Sacrament, and renewed my supplication with all the fervor of which I was capable. Oh, my God, I exclaimed, thy mercy is without limit. In the name of thine infinite goodness, permit not that the restoration of my son to health be atoned for by the death of my wife. <clears throat> I then made a vow to distribute 200 copies of your book in order to obtain copious relief for the suffering souls. At the same time, I besought the souls that had formerly been delivered to unite their prayers to those of the others still retained in purgatory. After this prayer, I returned home and saw my servants running to meet me. They told me that my dear wife was considerably better, that the delirium had ceased and her speech had returned. I hastened to her side and found all was true. I offered her nourishment, which she took with relish. A very short time afterwards, she was completely restored. That she accompanied me to the church to return thanks to God for all his mercy. Your reverence may place entire confidence in this statement. I pray you to aid me in thanking our Lord for this double miracle. Pray sin. Purgatory Explained, Part 2, Chapter 47 Advantages, Temporal Favors The following is related as a fact by the Abbe Pastel, the translator of Father Rosignoli's work. It took place in Paris, he says, about the year 1827, and is inserted as number 27 in the Merveilles du Purgatoire. A poor servant who had been brought up as a good Christian in her native village had adopted the pious practice of having a mass said <clears throat> every month for the suffering souls. Her employers, having taken her with them to the capital. She never once neglected it and furthermore made it her rule to assist at the divine sacrifice and to unite her prayers with those of the priest, especially for the soul that had most nearly completed its expiation. This was her ordinary intention. <clears throat> Thank you.
God soon tried her by a long illness not on, that not only occasioned her cruel suffering, but also caused her to lose her place and draw up upon her last resources. On the day that she was able to leave the hospital, she had but twenty suits left. After addressing a fervent prayer to heaven, full of confidence, she went in search of a situation. She was told that she would probably find employment in a certain family at the other end of the city, whither she went, and as she was obliged to pass by the church of St. Eustache, she entered. The sight of a priest at the altar reminded her that this month she had forgotten her usual mass for the dead, and that this was the very day upon which for many years she had been accustomed to do this good work. But what was she to do? If she disposed of her last franc, she would have nothing left, even to satisfy her hunger. It was a struggle between devotion and human prudence. Devotion gained the day, after all. After all, she said to herself, the good God knows it is for him, and he will not forsake me. Entering the sacristy, she gave her offering for a mass, at which she assisted with her usual fervor. A few mo <clears throat> moments after, she continued on her way, full of anxiety, as may be readily understood. Being absolutely destitute of means, what was she to do if she failed to obtain employment? She was still occupied with these thoughts when a pale young man of a slight figure and distinguished appearance approached her and said, Are you in search of a situation? Yes, sir. Well, go to a certain street and number, to the house of Madame so-and-so. I think you will find, I think you will suit her, and that you will be satisfied there. Having spoken these words, he disappeared in the passing crowd without waiting to receive the poor girl's thanks. She found the street recognized the number, and ascended to the apartments. A servant came out carrying a package under her arm and uttering words of complaint and anger. Is Madame there? asked the newcomer. She may or she may not be, replied the other. What does it matter to me? Madame will open the door herself if it suits her. I will trouble myself no longer about it. Adieu, and she descended the steps. Our poor girl rang the bell with trembling hand, and a sweet voice bade her to enter. She found herself in the presence of an old lady of venerable appearance, who encouraged her to make known her wishes. Madame, said the servant, I learned this morning that you are in need of a servant, and I came to offer my services. I was assured that you would receive me kindly. Oh, but dear child, what you tell me is very extraordinary. This morning I had no need of one. It is only within the last half hour that I have discharged an insolent domestic, and there is not a soul in the world except her and myself who know it. Who sent you, then? It was a gentleman, madame, a young gentleman whom I met on the street, who stopped me for this purpose, and I praise God for it, for it is absolutely necessary for me to find a place today. I have not a penny in my pocket. The old lady could not understand who the person was, and was lost in conjecture when the servant, raising her eyes to the furniture of the little parlor, perceived a portrait. Wait, madame, she said immediately. Do not puzzle yourself any more. This is the exact picture of the young man who spoke to me. 
It is on his account that I am come. At these words, the lady uttered a loud cry and seemed to lose consciousness. She made the girl repeat the story of her devotion to the souls in purgatory, of the morning mass, and her meeting with the stranger. Then, throwing herself on the neck of the girl, she embraced her amid a flood of tears and said, You shall not be my servant from this moment. You are my daughter. It is my son, my only son, whom you saw. My son dead for the past two years. Who owes to you his deliverance? Whom God directed to send you here. I cannot doubt it. May you then be blessed and let us pray continually for all those who suffer before entering into blessed eternity.